Well, my story begins on New Year's Day. I got a call from my daughter. So I said, hey, Catherine, how's it going? Happy New Year. Because I am a very dorky dad, all right? Now, that, then a man's voice came on the phone. Now, I knew my daughter had done a first date the night before New Year's Eve. So awkward. And the man said, are you Catherine's father? And I said, yes, yes, I am. And then the man said, this is the Boston Police Department. Your daughter tried to kill herself. We're taking her to the hospital. We need to get up here right away. As we drove up to Boston, we thought about our daughter's 10-year struggle with an eating disorder of pediatricians and primary care doctors who knew little or nothing about mental health about waiting for months to see a specialist only to find out they didn't have what we needed, of fighting with insurance companies to get even basic mental health services covered, of realizing that the advocacy and scientific community was not going to come to the rescue because of mental health are too fragmented and too underfunded. And mostly we felt the exhaustion of having gone to bed every night for months wondering if our daughter's going to be alive in the morning because of starvation and then having to get up and go to work the next day. We later found out that this dysfunction applies not just to eating disorders but to depression, anxiety, addiction, autism, postpartum, post-traumatic, OCD, ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia, other brain disorders. And it's not just our country, my country, the United States. The World Health Organization now says when it comes to mental health, every country is a developing country. Now, at the time, I was uh, working on global health care issues, cancer, HIV, diabetes, obesity, really the health care challenges of our time. And I started to talk to health ministers and doctors and patients about their countries, and I found out that that was true. It was, it was, not done well anywhere. And so I, I naively thought I could do something about this because uh, uh, I did work on these other illnesses. I thought, you know, how, how hard can it be? I, I really thought my family was uniquely unlucky. We don't hear that, that much about it. And I took a look at the U.S. National Institute of Health uh, research budget, and about 5% goes to mental health. So I thought that was probably commensurate with the size of the problem. But I started to talk to neuroscientists, and what I learned from them really blew me away. And it's really why I'm standing here today. According to the World Economic Forum, mental illness is forecast to account for more than half of the economic burden of all chronic diseases. More than half. So it's bigger than the combination of cancer, diabetes, and chronic respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, yeah, how can that be? That just doesn't make sense. Well, first of all, it turns out that uh, mental illness is a lot more common than we think. One out of four people, one out of four of us, will have a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in our lives. Um, it's also the only chronic disease of the young. All the other diseases that I mentioned tend to happen later in life. Half of all mental illness begins by the age of 14. And another 25%, so 75%, starts by the age of 24. And because it goes largely untreated, the economic cost, not just the health system cost, but mental illness is a leading cause of disability and, and productivity loss. So those economic costs pile up over lifetimes into the trillions of dollars. And that impact is now being amplified by our ongoing transition to a, a knowledge-based economy. And when I was a kid growing up in Detroit, you could get a good-paying job at the auto factories performing basically repetitive physical tasks. Those are all automated now. And any job that you get today, you have to have enough cognitive function to collaborate and innovate. The two hallmarks in our 21st century economy. <clears throat> And we're starting to read about it in our headlines. And I'll just give you two examples. Um, in the United States, before the pandemic, you can remember that far back, in the US, we lost life expectancy, went down three years in a row. 
That was the first time it happened in a hundred years. The last time was in the middle of World War I and the 1918 pandemic. That was the scale of what we were facing before this pandemic hit. But this time it was being driven by two preventable outcomes of mental illness, suicide and drug and alcohol poisoning. And then if you look outside the United States, you will find similarly shocking statistics. And the one that really grabbed my heart was that for the first time in recorded human history, the leading cause of death in recent years, some recent years, has no longer been childbirth, which it has always been in recorded history. It's been suicide. And there are a lot of reasons for that that I won't get into today, but I, when I learned that, I thought those girls were calling out to me the way my daughter did. And I, I think they're calling out to all of us. And they're saying, where's the anger? Where's the indignation? Where's the leadership to do something about this? So one thing was clear to me, I couldn't do this in my spare time, so I really threw myself into this with a lot of other people to try to find that leadership, not in myself, but in the community, among all of us. And these are things that I would invite all of you to think about doing in your communities, your organizations, either now or in the future. So first we went to our senior leaders in my company. And we said, look, we think there's a major opportunity to do for mental health what we have done for HIV. This was before the pandemic, but like we've done for COVID. What can you bring to this fight? And you will experience my experience, I think. Something very unexpected happened. Almost every one of these leaders got up and closed the office door. And they told me their personal story. And half of these very senior leaders wept openly just at the relief of being able to sh share what had happened to them and their families, and at the promise of maybe changing the paradigm. And then uh, something really remarkable happened. Every leader said, hey, I'm already doing something about it. Because when you see something that affects your family and your, your community and your employees, you, you try to make a contribution. So you know, just for example, our baby group was working on postpartum depression with world experts. We have a surgical division, and they were tackling opiate addiction and, and the anxiety and, and uh, depression that comes along with physical trauma related to surgery. Um, we also have our, our, our pharmaceutical division, which recently brought the COVID vaccine. They also brought to market recently the first new mechanism of action for the treatment of depression in 50 years. Five years. It's, a, it's a remarkable accomplishment, but it also speaks to the lack of progress in the science. So you know, it turns out that my organization, my community, was already leading. But like a lot of mental health, was very fragmented. Um, and so what we've tried to do is pull that all together and then partner with as many other outside people and groups as we could to, to, to make our collective effort much more uh, powerful than all these isolated, silent incidents, all these efforts, right? So we are uh, working together on attacking the stigma. That's the shame people feel when they have these illnesses. Um, and we, we, have a, we are encouraging our employees to tell their own stories. We're working with other employers, whether it's governments or, or private sector, to have their employees join in. Um, we are working with advocacy organizations, and now for the first time, and not, not because of me or because of our organization, but because everybody is working together, we have now a, the first time a global campaign for mental health. Advocates uniting around the world to, to share our stories and align our messages. And uh, we've also worked with CEOs, global CEOs, to create a, a round table, CEO roundtable on workplace mental health. Um, we're working with world leaders, uh, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, the royal family. It's very hard to get a picture with the royal family, I have to know. Uh, and also here at the bottom, our uh, uh, President Carter, Rosalind Carter was the, the first first lady to make mental health her signature issue. And then the, the thing that uh, my kids are really excited about and the, is you get to work with celebrities, because a lot of celebrities have stories to tell. So Jennifer Hudson, Michael Phelps, and our dear Glenn Close, right? Now, if you, all you do is raise awareness and tell your story, uh, but you don't change the system, the system wins every time. 
And we've seen this with systemic racism. You don't change the system, it always wins. So we've been working, um, first of all, getting our own house in order, trying to make sure that our employees have a better experience. But then, you know, we, we realize we can't do this by ourselves, so we're joining forces with other, uh, uh, with governments and, and companies and nonprofits to combine our purchasing power so that we can drive change in the system and ask insurance companies and providers to give us affordable, effective, quality, evidence-based care, which by and large is hard to find right now. And then finally, we're working on the science, because that's what, what our company does well, is the science. Um, we're working with the World Bank and the World Health Organization and the, with UNICEF, because this is a young people's challenge, and, we're, and other uh, players, and we're trying to create a global fund for mental health research, like the global fund that you might know about for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, the one that turned the tide on that pandemic. Now, if you put all that together, stigma, system, and science, you start to see some new things develop. And one of those things has to do with how we recruit now from universities and schools, right? For a long time, we've been recruiting from the LGBTQ community, the African American community, the veterans community, and so forth. And now you're seeing employers start to recruit from the mental health community. And we're saying, it's a similar message. We're saying, come work for us because we get this. We know that. Uh, mental, mental health is not well taken care of. We're going to support you. Uh, you can bring your authentic self to work. You don't have to hide the fact that you're bipolar or autistic or you're depressive. You can come, you'll, you'll get the support. You can bring your special qualities to the table. And we know you don't want to go back in the closet. It's not good for you, it's not good for the world, it's not good for us. I would add that. If you live with mental illness, either the one in four of us who have it ourselves or the two in four of us who are carrying somebody at home, estimated, that you have all the leadership qualities that the world needs and is looking for. Every organization is looking for servant leaders. We're not looking for somebody who has all the answers, we're looking for somebody who can pull out the best in a team. And servant leaders are humble. And if you've been living with mental illness, you know you're not perfect. Servant leaders, very important to have empathy. And if you live with mental illness, you know pain in yourself, and you can recognize it in somebody else across the room and know how to engage that. Servant leaders are open to new ideas and creativity, innovation. And if you live with mental illness, you've had to hack the healthcare system, you've had to hack the unconscious bias of your family and your community, and you've often had to hack your own mind, your own thoughts. So, there's no challenge that we can't put in front of you that you are not going to be ready to handle. And finally, servant leaders are, have grit. And if you've been living with mental illness, you, grit is your middle name. So think of yourselves as the leaders of the 21st century. You've already, you actually have the head start on everybody else, but you have the skill set that we're all looking for in servant leaders. So those are just some examples. We have a long way to go. We're talking about massive culture change, creating a culture of inclusion for neurodiversity and ending stigma. We're talking about massive system change, providing accessible, quality, effective care, and also advancing the science in remarkable new ways. But every disease has a turning point, and we're experiencing this right now with COVID. And I really feel like we're in a mental health moment where this future is in our grasp, and it's a future where everybody knows how common this is, and that it's not something to be ashamed about. It's part of the human condition, it's part of the individual journey. And I'd like to invite you to take a small step into that future together by raising your hand if either you or somebody you love has been affected by mental health. Just raise your hand. And keep your hands up just and take a look around. It's, it's just about everybody. And this cuts across the whole globe, no matter where you live or how you live, mental illness affects us all. So we can start to take meals to each other's homes, or we can do when somebody has a heart attack or cancer or COVID. We can start to really demand that the system give us quality, affordable, effective care. We can start to teach our young children, before they get to high school, as much about their mental health as we teach them about their dental health. 
And we can all declare once and for all, this is not about character or weakness. It's about chemistry in many cases, and in every case, it's about community. Now, on the fifth anniversary of that phone call, my family marked the occasion by going to a somewhat sacred place. And we hiked up the Inca Trail in Peru and over the Sun Gate and down into Machu Picchu. And the world that we are all trying to create in mental health is a world where everybody gets to do what I did, because I hugged my daughter, Catherine. She survived that suicide attempt and other struggles. She's changing her career from public relations to mental health. She's getting a master's in social work. And I think, because she doesn't want anybody to have to go through what she went through, she and I would like to invite you to join this effort. Now, it, it, it's said that uh, there's many neurons in the brain, as there are stars in our galaxy. And one of our forebears, John F. Kennedy, is remembered for launching the conquest of outer space. And I hope someday one of you will be remembered for the conquest of inner space. But we got to do this together. It's too big to handle alone. And so I invite you to join us in answering the call of history on mental health. Thank you.